welcome to this panel on peace and human rights at the 2021 edition of the State of the Union, organized by the European University Institute in Florence. My name is Sarah Nauen. I'm a professor of public international law at the EUI, and I'm absolutely delighted to moderate this panel. As part of a conference focused on the role of Europe in a changing world, this panel zooms in on the role, potential, and possibly challenges for the EU as a human rights promoting peace mediator. We have most impressive panelists to speak to this topic. The panel combines speakers with a unique internal perspective on the EU as a mediator and those with intimate external perspectives based on collaborations with the EU and peace mediation, which also allows them to draw comparisons with other mediating organizations. With us in virtual Florence are Jihan Sultanolu, Assistant Secretary General and United Nations Representative to the Geneva International Discussions. Now, there are lots of international discussions going on in Geneva, but Jihan is the UN representative to the Geneva International Discussions. Jihan, welcome. Thank and you very much. much. We really hope that in the discussions, you can tell us more about this mediation process with the most intriguing name of all. Federica Mogherini needs no introduction at the EUI, in Italy, in Europe, or in fact, in Iran, Serbia, and many other places in the world. She's currently rector of the College of Europe and is a former EU high representative for foreign affairs and security policy, in which role she mediated, among others, between Kosovo and Serbia. She's also famous for having successfully facilitated the negotiations on the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, better known as the Iran nuclear deal. We're also delighted to have with us Katia Papagiani, Director for Policy and Mediation Support of the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, a non-governmental organization headquartered in Geneva that mediates all over the world. Katia follows and supports all these HD supported processes and combines big picture overview with, of global trends with deep understanding of the specifics of all these relevant conflicts. Now, in case you thought that the world of peace mediation is a women's world only, let me now introduce Barney Afako, member of the United Nations Commission on Human Rights in South Sudan, member of the United Nations standby team of senior mediation advisors, and advisor to the African Union High Level Implementation Panel in South Sudan. As you can discern from many of his titles, Barney is usually the advisor, not the man in front of the cameras, although he has done press conferences too. He has been the political analyst and legal draftsman for many mediators, ranging from African presidents to UN representatives. And last but absolutely not least, we have all of you who participate via the digital platform. Please open the live discussion tab in the lower right hand corner of your screen. Here you can submit your questions for the speakers in the Q&A tab and post comments in the live chat. And if all of that is not enough, you can also tweet about the session using the hashtag, hashtag SOU2021. Time for substance. In 2012, the European Union received the Nobel Prize for Peace for advancing the causes of peace, reconciliation, democracy, and human rights in Europe. But the EU's aspirations have never ended at its borders. The EU wishes to export not just machinery, computers, and pharmaceuticals, but also peace. Directly or indirectly, the EU has been involved in a myriad of peace processes across the world ranging from direct to table mediation in the belgrade pristina dialogue and co-facilitating the Geneva international discussions to advising in the UN-led Yemen talks, acting as a guarantor of the peace agreement in Mali and supporting mediation capacity building exercises in the Philippines and Syria. Last year, the EU adopted an updated EU mediation concept aimed at further boosting the EU's role as a leading actor in peace mediation, and it developed specific guidelines for EU mediators and implementing partners. The EU presents itself as an explicitly value-based mediator. Its engagements are based on the core values of inclusion, human dignity, gender equality, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect and promotion of human rights. An evidence-based approach, climate awareness, multilateralism, 
are further key guiding principles of EU mediation. The EU's explicit ambitions in the field of peace mediation raise a whole range of questions. What are the strengths and what are the limitations of the EU as a mediator? What role does it feel be fulfill best? Leading as a mediator or facilitating and backing other mediators, politically, logistically, and financially? Is the EU's explicitly value-laden backpack a treasure chest or a heavy burden during a mediation process? Do these values promote agreement or resistance or both? So without further ado, let's begin with the basics, with my first question to all of you, my dear fellow panelists. My first question is, what is the EU's strength and what are its limitations, or perhaps we can even speak of weaknesses, when it comes to mediation or supporting mediation? Speaking from the various perspectives in which you have acted either for the EU or you have seen the EU operate, can you each give us one strength and one limitation? Federica, as the ultimate EU insider on this topic, may we start with you? With pleasure, Sarah. Thank you very much. Great to be back uh, in Florence, even if virtually, and great to be with such a, a great panel today. Uh, no surprise um, for me, uh, strengths are more evident than limitations. So I would tell you, uh, my instinctive reaction would be, I see plenty of strengths for the European Union uh, to act as a mediator. I don't see really limitations uh, unless uh, the European Union limits itself. The only limitation I see is the limitations that the European Union puts to itself uh, in terms of ambitions and, uh, and scope and, and uh, political will. I see many strengths of the European Union. I would say only one, uh, let me say two. Uh, I don't say any limitation, I, see two, I say two strengths. Uh, one is the fact that the European Union is uh, generally perceived as an onus broker. Uh, normally it doesn't come with a heavy agenda in most uh, regions of the world. Um, and second uh, is the fact that uh, as a mediator or facilitator, and the two things don't really coincide 100%, we'll come to that probably later in the discussion, the European Union can come with uh, a very complex, uh, complete and generous mix of incentives. And these incentives they can put on the table also in partnership and connection with other players like the UN or other regional organizations. So I think that this gives the Euro European Union uh, a lot of strength and potential in mediation and facilitation, sometimes not fully used. So again, the limit I see is the own limits that the European Union put to itself in terms of political will to engage in certain facilitation uh, and mediation activities. Jihan, in your capacity as UN representative, you work, work with the EU in a peace process. As a close partner, what do you see as the EU's strengths and perhaps their only strengths, or do you also see limitations or challenges? Um, thank you very much, uh, Sarah, and uh, my greetings to all the uh, fellow panelists and uh, all those who are watching uh, our uh, discussion uh, remotely. Uh, so um, let me actually tell you a little bit about the Geneva International Discussions as a, as, a, as a backdrop before I can answer your question. I have a distinct pleasure of being a tripartite agreement. Now, the Geneva International Discussions deal with the aftermath of the 2008 Russia-Georgia war and the implementation of the six-point ceasefire agreement that was brokered by the European Union. So as representatives of uh, this process, uh, so it is the EU, United Nations, and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, or OSCE, the three organizations, the representatives, we work hand in hand uh, to achieve, in fact, this uh, mandate in a very unique uh, structure. There is no other peace process that brings uh, the three organizations uh, together. And we work uh, cooperatively, collectively to manage the process, not only operationally, but also, uh, also politically. Now, the main strength of the EU in this process is the fact that it was the EU at the time of the presidency of the European Union under uh, French, uh, France under, under uh, President Sarkozy at the time, it was the EU who actually 
brought the partners to listen to its call to stop fighting and to stop further loss to lives and economic uh, context and the environment. So it was uh, EU's actually economic and political cloud, its influence that made the parties stop uh, fighting. Uh, at the same time, uh, the process also allowed the EU to deploy a mission in uh, Georgia to monitor the security situation. Uh, now, it is an undeniable fact that the strength that the EU brought to this uh, process to broker the peace at the same time is a challenge in the process of discussions itself. All our three organizations, of course, uh, are um, recognizing fully the territorial of integrity, territorial integrity of Georgia. Uh, EU is an ally of Georgia. EU is a big uh, supporter uh, of Georgia in its main policy ambition of uh, Euro-Atlantic integration. So many agreements have been signed between the EU and Georgia in the past decade with a view to further deepen the uh, political association and inte economic integration of Georgia to the EU. Therefore, the EU has to be overly sensitive to ensure that it is indeed perceived as a neutral mediator and facilitator in the discussions by all the participants in the rounds of negotiation, as well as in all the meetings and consultations that take place around the negotiations. This can be a difficult position to, to juggle. Uh, but in my opinion, it's essential to protect the integrity of the process and to create an environment of trust for all the participants to be able to produce tangible results. Great. So we go from one challenge um, to Barney. Barney, you've seen the EU when you worked for the EU, for, for the AU and for the UN. What, what is your vision on this question? I would say that the EU reflects its commitment to mediation and peacemaking very often in the way that it supports both the structures and architecture for mediation and peacemaking, whether that's in the United Nations, where the EU is a supporter of the standby team and mediation support unit mechanism. Similarly, in the African Union, it has been one of the key supporters of that organization's architecture for peacemaking. And this is not just limited to, if you like, the structural support to, to the headquarters of the organizations, but when you do have peace processes, uh, and I've seen this both in Uganda and also in Sudan, the EU is often present with its diplomacy and its resources to facilitate negotiations, which increasingly are very costly undertakings. So, so it, it deploys its resources often to guarantee the inclusion of those processes so that money is, is not an obstacle to wider participation. What it's then able to do effectively, though not driving the process in the, uh, as a lead mediator, it's able, if you like, to infiltrate its values and, and, and support to the process in a relatively less obtrusive way. And this may be unique to the way that the EU has to work on the, on the African continent, but it's, it's, it's been a feature of its intervention, uh, backing up its, its resources uh, with, with institutional support, but also ad hoc specific support to peace processes. And I think, Sarah, you were able to, to, to deploy your legal skills to the Sudan process, thanks also to, to, to the EU's uh, support for, for that expertise, uh, which was very much appreciated and welcome. Now, it, when it comes to limitations, it, it's in the name of the EU, it's in its structure, its personnel, that it's essentially European. So I might even say, Central European in, in, in posture. And therefore, when it goes outside of that region, particularly when it goes as far afield as the African continent, it's not necessarily seen as a natural 
mediator with a deep grasp of all elements of the conflict before might turn to other interlocutors uh, for that. So that is a structural uh, limitation. And I think also that the architecture within the EU for mediation support is still being developed and maybe its diplomats need to do more, um, more mediative work, even though they're not themselves, the lead mediators. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Barney. So Barney has really taken us into the world. Katya, you too have observed the EU all over the world. What are your, uh, what is your one strength and one limitation, or perhaps you have many more, but can you choose? Thank you, Siren. It's really a pleasure to be here with my fellow panelists, and I look forward to the Q&A also after our conversation. Uh, I should start by saying that the EU is undeniably one of the most important mediation actors in the world today. It's engaged in every single major peace process, and it does so through a diverse toolbox and a sophisticated toolbox and set of uh, networks around the world. So that's something we just need to say at the beginning, that it's uh, undeniably an important actor in the peacemaking field today. Uh, I agree very much with the comments my, my fellow panelists have made, especially with Federica's comment about the EU being perceived as an honest broker. But where I'm sitting, um, as uh, someone who has worked both for informal and formal mediation organizations, I thought maybe I should focus on the EU's strength in terms of the centrality it puts on partnerships when it engages in mediation uh, processes. And partnerships do three main things for the European Union in its role as a mediation support or mediation actor. First, they allow the European Union to take risks. Um, mediation processes are risky endeavors, um, and uh, some of the engagements with the difficult non-state armed groups are delicate, uh, long-term, and politically sensitive. When those engagements are taking place through a partner, they assist the European Union to take the risk without necessarily bear all of the risk itself. There are many examples that we can discuss in the Q&A uh, on this aspect of partnership. A second advantage of partnerships for the European Union as a mediation actor is that they allow the European Union to respond very rapidly in crisis moments. An excellent example of European Union response was last year. At the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, the United Nations Secretary General issued a global call for a ceasefire so that the planet will be able to focus on uh, addressing the important challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic. The European Union, through a number of partnerships, managed within four to five months to facilitate the negotiation of close to 15 ceasefire agreements in support of that call. I think that's an important contribution of extending the European Union's reach uh, and ability to respond quickly in a moment of crisis. And third, the partnerships allow the European Union to complement some of the official mediation processes that take place in multilateral forums, which often, for a number of reasons, including geopolitical realities that have been discussed throughout the day at this conference, are stuck or are not moving as quickly as they could. An example of this is a number of dialogues that the European Union is partnering with a number of organizations in Southeast Asia, including between China and its neighbors, and including on sensitive issues such as South China Sea. So with these partnerships, the European Union is able to strengthen and complement official negotiation processes that are taking place within ASEAN and other multilateral fora. So I think it's that I thought it would be important to point out that through its partnerships, the European Union becomes a more um, a, an actor with even wider reach and an actor that can take even more risks than it could normally take. In terms of the weakness, this is something that has been discussed, I think, throughout this conference. And it's um, I, I would say the European Union's inability um, in some conflict context to have a united voice. And I think it refers to Federica's comment of the European Union itself um, limiting the role and the ambition that uh, it has for its role in certain situations. And I think one of the preeminent examples of um, this lack of one voice is the European Union's role in Libya up to a year ago, let's say, when at some moments of the peace process and the mediation effort, member states seem to be at odds with each other and 
pursuing divergent agendas. This is a major weakness, but I think as Federica said, it's not an irredeemable weakness. It's a question of having the political will to fix it. So talking about the, the EU limiting itself, we can also look at, at the policy documents. And there, there seems to be an inherent tension in some of these policy documents. And of course, policies are always about reconciling tension. So it's not nothing surprising. But one of those tensions seems to be on the one hand, an ambitious universalizing normative agenda. And on the other hand, a recognized need for humility and respect for local contexts. And that requires what Barnier refer to understanding of local context. Now, the normative agenda seems to have expanded over the years. So the 2009 concept on mediation, the norms were mostly around transitional justice, human rights, participation of women. In 2020, it also includes a much broader inclusivity agenda, concern for the climate and natural resources, and also concern for cultural property. And this normative agenda is not unique to the EU as a mediator, the UN too, uh, as, as Dion will be able to elaborate, has issued more and more normative guidance as to issues that its mediators must raise and try to address. So my question to all of you is, if one arrives with such a broad list of predetermined issues that must be considered, how much space is there for the particularities of the local context to speak? What role does this backpack with values play during a mediation process? Is it easily offloaded or should it actually be fuller? Jihan, speaking from the UN's experience, would you like to start? Yes, um, thank you. Now, if we um, look at uh, international norms and standards, the UN uh, is uh, the main forum indeed uh, for their development. And in a way, the UN is the keeper of these norms and standards. Uh, based on its comparative advantages that we all uh, are very much aware, its normative role, it is convening power, universal legitimacy, neutrality, and global reach. Um, I think the values are very well embodied in the 2030 agenda, and it's accompanying 17 sustainable development goals agreed upon by 193 member states of the United Nations in 2015. And these, uh, this agenda 2030 provides a roadmap for humanity and for our planet to achieve a world of peace and uh, prosperity by eradicating poverty, uh, ensuring uh, human rights, finding inclusive and sustainable development solutions and by basically leave no one behind. The goal 16 is particularly a favorite of mine. It deals with peace, justice, and strong institutions. The EU too is committed to the uh, sustainable development goals and encourages uh, the EU countries to do the same. So this, in my opinion, actually is the window from which we should observe all our actions. We need a holistic, comprehensive approach to conflict uh, resolution. Uh, while all disputes and conflicts uh, have their own specificities and they need tailor-made approaches based on, of course, um, best practices, lessons learned, for effective mediation, for peaceful and sustainable so the resolution of conflicts, we need to focus on um, actions that will maximize our chances of success. National ownership is as essential as applying international law and normative frameworks. Again, for me, it's a question of balance. In my previous answer, I was actually more referring to challenges that the EU has than uh, its weaknesses. So it's a question of balance because the credibility of the process of the mediators depend very much on achieving actually this, this, this balance. We talk about impartiality, we talk about consent, inclusivity, but these are qualities indeed that allow us to build a foundation of trust and credibility, but it's also something that we have to continuously work on. I mean, you cannot just earn the trust, you have to keep at it all the time. So it is a dynamic process, it is not just, um, having a blueprint and uh, working with that. 
Um, Katia talked about the Secretary General's uh, appeal for a, a global ceasefire. The appeal uh, also got a very good political boost last July when the UN Security Council adopted a resolution. But despite the successes, I think the adherence to it has been quite uh, mixed. Uh, for me, the call of the Secretary General is actually also a call for a more cohesive approach to peace building and peace uh, keeping. Not only we have to work uh, closely together to respond to emerging challenges, but we also have to be prepared to take advantage of such challenges to find new ways of cooperation and uh, resolving our uh, differences. The pandemic is a wake up call for everyone. The inequalities between countries and inside the countries, the growing gaps between the haves and the have nots, the threats uh, to our environment, uh, the climate change, they all have become more glaring. So the question that um, I have is then, how do we create better systems, piece by piece, place by place, issue by issue, in everything that we do so that uh, we can indeed achieve this, uh, this uh, better state of uh, being. And that of course includes all the peace uh, processes uh, also. Thanks so much, Rihan. So this was uh, really an, an account yeah, explaining uh, the UN's normative backpack. Katja, you work for a non-governmental organization that does an enormous amount of mediation across the world, the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. Now, you don't have, as a matter of law, <laughs> that, that, or those norms. Um, how do you look at the, the, EU, or the, or the EU, if you compare your own organization and the EU that has the policy with the norms? Um, what is your perspective? Thank you, Sarah. I think it's a very important question to ask whether the normative backpack, as you call it, that the European Union has committed itself to carrying um, with itself when it engages in mediation processes is an asset or a burden. And I think it's not a simple question to ask with a yes or no, to answer with a yes or no answer. It really has this unsatisfying, it depends uh, quality to it. On one hand, um, we are all very conscious of the fact that the international community currently, uh, for better or for worse, enjoys a very weak uh, level of consensus around shared normative frameworks. This means that in certain situations where the EU may be committed to pursue its normative agenda and to bring its normative backpack with it, it may, be, it may find itself without allies, without backers, uh, fighting the fight uh, alone. However, there is, uh, I think, a lot of experience in the mediation field the past 30 years that points to the fact that strategic, in a strategic and pragmatic way, an experienced and uh, sophisticated mediation actor is able to pursue, possibly in modest ways, a normative agenda and to still be an effective and productive mediation actor, meaning pursuing conflict resolution goals. I don't want to under, underestimate the challenges for doing that. They're really immense. And I think we're all witnessing the difficulty of that playing out currently in Afghanistan. However, there is an approach that the, Un the European Union is well suited for that will allow it to be a productive mediation actor and a normative mediation actor. And that is the approach that you alluded to, Sarah, and that is one of humility, modesty, engagement with local actors, and long-term engagement. According to this approach, the normative backpack, the norms and principles that the mediation actor is committed to are not the list of requirements and demands that have to be implemented tomorrow. Rather, they are a compass that point the way towards which a mediation process, a peace process, gradually and progressively, ideally, will move toward to. So let me give you a few, a, a couple of thoughts on how this, to explain this a bit more. First is that, of course, we're all aware that human rights, women's rights, all these other norms that the European Union has committed itself to um, are realized progressively over generations in some cases. Now, the role of mediation processes is to create the conditions to open the door for these rights to gradually start being realized. There is no one peace agreement or one mediation process or peace process that will definitively offer the protection and promotion of these rights and these norms forever. 
rather the role of the mediation process is to start to offer the conditions for those norms to hope at least have the chance to be realized in the future. And we have a lot of experience as a, as a peacemaking field of agreements that have included provisions that have opened the political space in the post-agreement period, that have allowed voices of diverse background to organize, to express themselves, to create alliances, and to themselves pursue the norms that they think are important for their national context. And I think the European Union is exactly the actor that is well placed with its approach and its post remediation to pursue this approach. Second, I think an important requirement for any normatively motivated mediation actor is to be able to translate the norms into concrete initiatives so that they're not, they don't remain in the stratosphere of ethics, morality, and principle, but they are tangible and they're meaningful in the context in which the mediator is engaged. So in order to create these tangible initiatives, it's incumbent upon the mediator to work again with local actors and to identify what these in concrete initiatives are that are consistent with the norms and principles that the mediator is committed to. An example of that is the, the recent experience that the United Nations and other organizations, including myself, um, had in supporting Libyan women in the past, let's say, six to eight months, the Libyan women themselves took the initiative to convene themselves on the sidelines of the official mediation process. The United Nations offered extremely valuable support to them through a number of means um, that I'm sure Barney knows very well, including social media outreach, etc. But these women on their own decided that this initiative was important to them. And with the support that was offered to them, they, uh, across political spectrum, agreed on a declaration that specifically put, put, put forward specific proposals on what they thought the role of women should be in the transitional period. This is a kind of initiative that takes a norm and a principle and translates it into concrete action that makes sense in the local context. So with this approach, with this normative approach to mediation, I think the European Union is well a place to play a very productive role and the European and, and the approach would be pragmatic and strategic, recognizing that the mediation process is simply the beginning of the re realization of rights and norms and principles and not the end and working very closely with local actors to articulate initiatives that make sense for the local context and are still consistent with the norms and principles. Again, I I want to repeat that I do not underestimate the incredible difficulties in doing in implementing this approach, but it's something that has been done before and just requires commitment and especially commitment for the long term by an actor like the European Union. Thank you, Sarah. So the, the backpack can either be a treasure chest or a burden, but a lot depends on how the mediator carries that backpack and especially when the backpack gets open. Barney. Yes, yeah, increasingly uh, because of this backpack that, that you mentioned, Sarah, uh, the moment of negotiation or peace talks, if you like, is seen as the time to offload that backpack and the different ways of doing this. And I think Katya was alluding to the fact that the astute uh, mediator or, or facilitator will find a way of communicating or transmitting uh, what's in that backpack, those values in a way that they can be a understood, but more than that adopted and internalized by the parties. This often takes time. It takes a certain craft. Unfortunately, we, we very often see mediators under pressure to offload their backpack and, and mediators who are in a hurry uh, to complete the process, often for good reason that uh, th that a lot of communities are, are suffering and the adverse impacts from the conflict. But so you cannot have shortcuts to the way that we engage with societies and lead actors in those societies uh, to, to change their perspective uh, towards the values that, that we want to espouse. So mediation and facilitation and support of a process at its best uh, will seek to broaden the imagination of the parties to get their buy-in into, into these values. And, and this can be achieved 
as a craft. Uh, so, so we need to underscore that beyond the values, the backpack, offloading it, putting it on might be the easy part, but taking it off and emptying its, its contents needs to be reflected upon and, and needs to be systematic and sensitive uh, to that context. All of this makes mediation facilitation complex and there should be a division of labor and an allocation of various strands of time to, to offloading this backpack of, of values. But I don't think we'll be able to go back to a form of mediation where the mediator is completely neutral and, 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 and comes with an empty bag. I think this is a reality, but what we have to catch up with is, is, is how we play a much more um, educative role, a much, a much more facilitative role so, so that these values are truly internalized. Yeah, so for those who are just tuning in and thinking, what is this EU backpack all about? We're talking about norms that the EU carries with it when it's promoting media or when it's trying to mediate across the world. Now, on that note, uh, Federica, you negotiated the Iran nuclear deal. Are such policy documents, such as the concept of mediation, including all the norms on uh, inclusivity, on, on women's rights, on human rights, on uh, respect for cultural property. Are such concept notes also relevant to such negotiations? And if not, why not? Why wouldn't that, why wouldn't the concept note apply to such a mediation or facilitation? Well, uh, before I, I answer the question, Sarah, let me comment on the uh, EU um, uh, pack, uh, backpack uh, on, on norms and values. Uh, and I very much agree uh, with uh, those that said that it, it's more of a method than, than an outcome. Uh, the point, uh, at, at least in my experience in, in those five years, the point is for the European Union when it acts as a mediator or facilitator uh, to, to bring the attention of the parties to the possibility to open spaces. Uh, I think Katya mentioned this, this expression to let women or young people or minorities participate in the process without, uh, without determining the outcome of the process. Uh, but, but simply, simply, not simple at all. Uh, it's not easy, it's simple, but it's not easy. Uh, setting the space for an inclusive process that takes into consideration within the process some principles and values and norms without determining the outcome of it, because the ownership of the process is as relevant as, as the normative framework. So I think this is really the, the, the fine line, the, the very thin line uh, that a mediator like the European Union can walk uh, in bringing in the values and principles it stands for in mediation and, and negotiation without imposing an outcome to the parties, uh, uh, allowing the space to be open. Again, the example of women in mediation is, is perfect. Uh, the work the European Union has done on, on Libyan women, on Syrian Lib women, on, on women in Yemen, just to allow them to participate, to come in the process, to have their voices heard, then the outcome is to be seen. But empowering is already, I would say, setting the stage for a different kind of, uh, of, of uh, game uh, that is played. Now, the Iran nuclear deal was a completely different setup, I have to say. And, and, and your question is perfect because you ask if it applies. Uh, the, the Iran nuclear uh, negotiations were uh, a unique uh, setup uh, in institutional terms and in political terms because it was not actually the European Union uh, mediating. Uh, it was uh, uh, the UN Security Council uh, many years ago um, uh, mandating the high representative, so an individual uh, with a name and a surname at the time, Javier Solana, uh, and then afterwards, uh, Catherine Ashton and myself, to facilitate on behalf of the UN Security Council on a very clear framework of negotiation. Uh, and so it was the high representative of the European Union having the task to facilitate a multilateral process under the umbrella of the United Nations Security Council and actually reporting to the Security Council uh, with some of the member states involved in that uh, mediation, in that facilitation process. But in that context, the high representative of the European Union was and still is the facilitator of many players, among which EU member states. 
so there was a certain distance, um, and, and there it was really a personal uh, task of the high representative to facilitate the process. Uh, so I wouldn't, there it was very, uh, and it is still, I believe, for Borel, uh, extremely delicate to, to, uh, to, to, to define when you speak uh, on behalf of the European Union and when you speak on behalf of all the parties involved in, in the facilitation. For me, it was always uh, clear that whenever I was speaking on the negotiations on the Iran nuclear deal, I was also speaking on behalf of Russia, China, the United States, Iran, and the, uh, and the E3. Uh, and then it was a separate task to report back to the 28 at my time, 27 now, and make sure that all the member states of the European Union and the European Union as such was involved in the negotiations and in the implementation of the agreement as a whole, but the role of facilitator there is a personal one uh, out of the mandate of the of the Security Council. It's a very uh, it's it's a very unique um, institutional framework. I believe it could be uh, an experiment to be potentially extended to other classes and, and facilitations because uh, it has a unique uh, uh, mix of legitimacy. You have the UN. Security Council um, mandate, but you also have the, that mix of toolbox uh, that the European Union can use. Uh, and it, I, I found it fascinating to use this, this, this mix. Uh, but indeed, in, in the specific case of Iran, the nuclear facilitation was, uh, uh, and again, it was a facilitation. The European Union was not part of the mediation, but was the high representative was facilitating the talks, but the European Union was not a party of the negotiations. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a very interesting exercise to, to differentiate between being a part of a, of a negotiation and being, uh, and being the facilitator of a process. It's two completely different uh, exercises. But I think that uh, there's this kind of uh, also formal link and mandate from the UN Security Council to the EU High Representative to facilitate a process without the European Union formally as a whole being involved in it can be an interesting experiment also for other classes and conflicts around the world because it allows you to, to use all the spaces you can have. Yeah, fantastic. And it also shows the importance of framing and how framing of mediation of facilitation and of certain disputes um, yeah, determines what kind of policies are, are relevant. Thank you Absolutely, so much. because, you know, at the end of the day, again, uh, for instance, for me, uh, I was uh, uh, able to take distance. So I was the, the harness broker and, and the neutral player that a facilitator uh, is in, in such a complex context, you can only imagine. But also at a certain moment, and in some moments only, uh, I could hint at the possibility of mobilizing the European Union toolbox in support of the implementation of an agreement the following day because an agreement doesn't stop the moment it's signed, actually it starts the moment it's signed, then the most difficult part is the implementation of it. And so this, this mix of competences could uh, well give the freedom and the liberty to the facilitator to act freely as a facilitator should be, but also uh, engage and commit uh, instruments, resources uh, and tools for the implementation of the agreement the day after, mobilizing the entire European Union um, toolbox. So, I found it really creative, but uh, extremely successful as a creative solution. Well, my, my final question is a short one, and hopefully uh, short questions are easy to therefore have short, easy answers from you. So the question is this, the EU has leverage, doors open for the EU where they don't open for others. How could the EU better or e even better use that leverage to promote peace across the world? Katja, would you like to start this time? Thank you, Sarah. And I will be very brief. My comment and idea in response to your question feeds uh, of what Federica just said about mobilizing the EU's toolbox. And I think throughout the day at this conference, there has been reference to the importance of the integrated approach that the European Union can be utilizing in, in its foreign policy engagements. So briefly, the reality we live today in the peace mediation field is a reality of uh, uh, peace agreements that break uh, very often, 
that don't last long, that are fragile, and they need a lot of support. We also have the reality of weak states and cross-border activities of middle of military actors, and of course the reality of military and political actors not having enough incentives to move to peace because the, the benefits of the war economy are significant. So with this brief framing of the reality of peace process, I think there is a, a, a great possibility for the European Union to utilize exactly the toolbox that I think Federica was referring to in the form of peace dividends, um, at crucial moments of uh, the peace process and the mediation process in order to encourage move towards um, peaceful uh, uh, economies in order to delink parts of the population, the civilian population from criminal activities and war focused activities, economic activities, and in this way to strengthen the agreements that have been produced by the mediation process. So yes, there is a, a lot of potential right now, I think, to, to bridge and to strategically use in tandem the development economic uh, toolbox of the European Union with a diplomatic and mediation toolbox. Barney, do you have other ideas for potential? Indeed, I think that that leverage is is most e effective when it is exercised when there has been a presence in situ already. Um, it's very difficult to come in from the outside for the first time at the point of resolution and be effective in the leverage. I've seen the EU in Uganda was supporting at different levels, efforts to end the conflict in the north of that country. It supported local actors, while at the same time engaging with the state in developing policies uh, for, for the recovery of, of, of northern Uganda. So when it came to the point of negotiations, uh, it already had a track record of that engagement. And it also strengthened its role in, if you like, translating some of what it heard at the local level to the state because the state was not always very good at, at, at uh, picking up on uh, the, the views and concerns of people at the local level. So the best way of exercising leverage and yet you're most effective when you don't need to talk about it uh, very loudly, when your actions and policies and interventions demonstrate that you uh, you put your money where your mouth is in terms of your values. So even on issues like, like climate, et cetera, if the EU is already supporting interventions in that area, it will be easier uh, to then make those linkages and introduce the issues during the peace process. Thank you. Yeah, please. Um, Sarah, uh, you mentioned at the very beginning that the EU was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in uh, 2012. Uh, indeed, EU has shown to the world that it is possible to come together after centuries of war and have lasting reconciliation. So uh, EU leads by example. I think that is a, that's a huge place to, to start from. We also talked about EU and the UN. And of course, so many EU countries are major contributors to the UN, especially when it comes to sustainable development. And as Katya said, this is indeed part of having all these processes supporting each other in a very cohesive, comprehensive manner. EU has also been uh, very much involved in the reform of the UN uh, to make it fit for the 21st century. So all of this is indeed a huge uh, capacity to leverage economically, politically, socially, which the EU is, is, is uh, actually doing. And also this is what gives the EU its global uh, reach. Uh, very quickly on the, on the values, maybe more generally. First, um, I think, you know, values, uh, they have to be, I seem to have frozen, but um, I, I think values, uh, they have value if they are applied consistently, you know, that is what gives value their power, that is what makes people want to emulate them, and that's what makes people to, to aspire to them. The second uh, point, um, you implied, uh, Sarah, earlier that humility and respect are essential to make progress, especially in peace uh, processes. So an, an, an element that we haven't talked about is empathy. Maybe we, you know, 
implied again empathy, but we didn't uh, mention it. So for me to start from a place of um, trying to understand the other is integral to maximizing chances of success. And eventually, if we actually want to want to achieve a, a, a world that we can uh, proudly, I think, uh, leave to the next uh, generations. Thank you so much. And I wouldn't be surprised if that were one of the parties calling you, because I know you're an incredibly high demand. Federica, you are the one with the ultimate insider's perspective. Any advice for your successors about how the EU can do more or use its leverage better to promote peace across the world? My successors don't need advice, but uh, um, I would say three things um, I think can say maximize and multiply uh, the leverage that the European Union has on, on facilitation and mediation. The first one is uh, uh, respect uh, and humility. Uh, I, I think that because of the colonial past of Europe, we have to be cautious about that. We have to know that the first step is listening, understanding, and, uh, uh, and serving. Uh, if I can use a, a word that is not always uh, uh, often used, but uh, I think it is important for Europeans to understand that they have to apply respect and humility whenever they go uh, mediating or facilitating a process. The second one uh, is uh, partnership. Uh, I think leverage is multiplied by partnerships. I think Barney was referring to that. And the European Union is very good in partnering uh, with uh, regional players, local players, uh, uh, civil society, NGOs, even very local uh, experiences or multilateral organizations, UN agencies, whatever, partnering uh, and not playing it solo. I think this is the multiplier of the leverage. And the third element uh, is uh, uh, using the positive leverage. Uh, we focus sometimes on uh, on the um, on, on the deterrent, on on the uh, on the measures that can be imposed against one of the parties uh, in a conflict or in a crisis, uh, sanctions or things like that. I think that we not often uh, focus enough on the positive incentives that we can offer to the parties to a conflict. What do you gain from it? What uh, what is there for you? At the end of the day, the parties in a conflict. Uh, accept uh, an agreement if they think that there is something good for them in it. Uh, and how do you implement it the day after? And in this, I think the European Union has the best potential uh, to, 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 to expand uh, the, the, the potentiality of, a, of an agreement to stand over time. Um, what is there for former combatants? What is there for reconciliation? We have lived through this in Europe. Um, post uh, The transition between from, from dictatorships to, to democracy, uh, reunifications of, of countries, uh, post-war uh, reunifications and reconciliations. We have gone through everything in Europe. We know how to, I would say, to mend the wounds of, of a conflict. And I think that is the added value of the European mediation uh, and facilitation um, uh, toolbox to, to, to offer the positive incentives so that everybody can come out of an agreement Probably seeing in that agreement also parts they don't like, but recognizing that single line that is vital for them. And to make sure that everybody recognizes that single bit that for them is absolutely important and have it implemented the day after. So partnerships, humility and, and respect, and um, using the positive incentives and yes, the peace dividend as somebody put it. Wow, if I were asked to update the mediation concept note, I think some of these words would really be the first opening sentences. Absolutely beautiful advice from, from everybody. I have many, many more questions, but there are also questions uh, from our participating audience. And um, I would like to put a few and then we'll go to the panel and then everybody can choose with which question they engage. But also please take the freedom to comment on um, what other panelists have said during the discussion. So pick up on earlier ideas. Um, but the question that I'm gonna read out is, the EU wears many hats in relation to conflict. In addition to being a peace mediator, it's also a humanitarian development, security, military and migration management actor. How do these agendas affect the EU's role as a peace mediator? Although the EU recognizes the nexus um, between these uh, different areas, there are also significant normative, political, and practical tensions at their intersections. Can the EU operationalize the nexus? 
without securitizing peace and without compromising its commitment to human rights. Um, and another question relates to the inclusivity debate. Inclusivity these days is like motherhood and apple pie. I mean, who can be against inclusion? But of course, could it also be that, that, that focusing on the inclusivity agenda or actually really pushing inclusivity has a cost? And a third question relates to root causes. So the uh, mediation concept note also says, and a lot of mediators say, you need to address the root causes. But there's a counter argument, and that says conflict change over time. And if one really wants to address the root cause at the moment of peacemaking, perhaps too much, you know, too much almost depends on the peace agreement instead of, for instance, the constitutional process that follows. Uh, so should peace processes, I mean, the actual peace negotiations, and can they actually address root causes? Now, we have five minutes left. So um, if I may, I hand over to the floor, beginning with Federica. And then um, if everybody could respond in one minute, I know it's very short, but take whatever you want to say, whether it has something to do with the question or not. I'll try to answer to the first question. Um, I've, uh, I've seen many and I've, uh, I've led, I would say, uh, as a high representative, many EU mediated or facilitated processes or processes where the European Union was accompanying a mediation or facilitation done either by the UN or the African Union or other, uh, other organizations. And I would say that uh, um, in, in general, uh, the different uh, uh, strands of work, the different agendas, being it humanitarian development, trade even, they can be even digital or economic development, whatever, uh, normally uh, are coordinated in a way that they support the mediation and facilitation processes. So we try, I still say we, because still, um, I, I consider still the College of Europe as somehow a, a European Union institution, even if of different nature. We try to, to make uh, a certain coherence uh, work uh, among the different uh, uh, strands of work. It doesn't always happen, doesn't always work, but the idea is to have the humanitarian development, the trade, and all the different components of the EU policies serve uh, a unique goal. And I don't see any risk. This is something I, I want to really underline of, um, of um, having a secretarian approach to mediation and, 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 and facilitation. Why? Because if you work on the ground, you perfectly understand that without a certain degree of security, there's basically nothing you can do. You have to move around the country. You have to be able to deliver aid if it's a matter of humanitarian aid or develop a project. A certain level of attention to security, uh, it would be naive not to have it. Uh, and it would serve the purpose of those that are actually opposing the, the, the peace processes uh, in most uh, situations. Sorry, I took even more time than I thought uh, I would have. Thank you. You had a clear message. Jihan. Um, let me maybe tackle the inclusivity and the root uh, causes. Um, I think um, we cannot um, approach the future without analyzing the past and understanding actually what are not only the um, historical elements um, that are causing these conflicts, but there is also a lot of emotion, you know, when we are talking about conflicts. So it's very critical to understand that, that, that package, but the focus should be on the future. And the future is about the sustainability of the process. I mean, the peace doesn't just start and end with a ceasefire agreement. And to make that sustainable, we definitely have to bring inclusivity into it. I was referring to the sustainable development goals. If we leave anybody behind, that means the, what we have done is not, is not actually lasting. So the idea is indeed not to look at the peace process in a silo, but to look at it in a comprehensive manner, bringing together all the elements and all the stakeholders. I'll stop there for the sake of my other panelists. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. I fully ag agree that the peace process should be forward looking because some of the challenges and the fractures that come up in society are from new developments. The discussion on climate uh, uh, emphasizes that. So, so as much as we need to address the past, we would fail in our job if we don't try to anticipate from current trends where the society will be in 10, 20 years. And we try to leave behind institutions and also social mechanisms that will be resilient and will protect and support the cohesion of the society going forward. Thank you. 25 seconds. 
Gotcha. <laughs> Just quickly on the inclusivity question, Sarah, and I agree with everything that has been said already. Um, I think there is no way of putting the inclusivity gene back into the bottle. Uh, there is a global demand for voice, especially among the young generations. So our job as mediation and peacemaking practitioners is to think of how we um, we practice it rather than whether we practice it. And it's not a question of bringing people to one negotiation table. Uh, peace processes are fragmented, have multiple tables, multiple aspects, of, as we have discussed already. And there's plenty of creativity out there in the mediation field on how to do it to promote inclusion at all stages of the peace process. I'll stop there. Thank you so much to all the panelists for a really rich discussion. And I would like to thank everybody who's been watching for joining us. Stay tuned because the next panel um, on peace and human rights will actually be on the opposite of what Federica mentioned, the positive incentives. It will be on the EU and sanctions. So please join us, stay tuned in, and to the panelists, thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure.